Um, en lep dober večer. Uh, najprej par besed o slovenščini, uh, pa bomo uh, uh, se predstavili na angliški jezik. Moje ime je Boštjan Nedoh, prihajam iz Filozofskega inštituta, uh, ki danes organizira predavanje uh, našega gostojočega uh, profesorja raziskovalca uh, Arturja Bredja iz uh, Univerze Lancaster v Veliki Britaniji. Uh, naslov vidite na, na na displeju zgoraj. Um, uh, Artur bo predaval v angleškem jeziku. Uh, tam okoli 45 minut bo uh, dolgo predavanje, sledi uh, seveda diskusija. Uh, let's switch to, to English. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce you uh, my uh, dear colleague and friend uh, Arthur Bradley from Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. Um, Arthur will give us a talk today uh, with the title Human Interest Towards uh, Best Theory of Money. And the talk will last uh, roughly 45 minutes and then we will have a Q&A uh, uh, section. Uh, before I leave the floor to, to Arthur, just a couple of words um, regarding uh, his work. He works at the intersection of comparative literature, political theory, political theology and political philosophy, understood all four fields in a really broad, broad sense. Uh, he's the author of uh, six? Five, six, yeah. Five, six book? Who's counting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, each of them uh, quite remarkable, like uh, really unique uh, book projects. Uh, and to, to mention the, just the most recent book uh, is Unbearable Life, a genealogy of political erasure, which came out in 2019 with uh, Columbia University Press. Um, in this book, Arthur tried to define uh, um, to, to, to yeah, find a new way beyond nihilism and, and vitalism to think uh, the concepts of life and death in the theory of sovereignty. And I, well, yeah, to 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 great degree, um, I, th I think you succeed to provide a really new insights, a new concept with unbearable life uh, that uh, allows us to think um, this traditional concept in political theory a bit new. Um, so yeah, this is it as the introduction. Um, enjoy, I, I had the chance to read the paper in advance and listen to Arthur, uh, the same, roughly the same talk. Um, I like it very much and I hope you'll like it uh, as well. So enjoy. Thank, thanks very much, Bastian. Hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, Thank you, Boss Jan. Thanks to the Institute for hosting me uh, this evening. And thanks to all of you for coming out on a, on a cold, dark night. Um, this is going to be hopefully quite a light and accessible paper. There is a, a much longer version which, is, which has just been published, uh, but uh, I'm going to give you the, the abridged version uh, this evening. So as you can see, it's called Human Interest Towards a Bestiary of Money. And I'm going to begin with a quotation from The Merchant of Venice. Antonio says, was this inserted to make interest good or is your gold and silver use and rams? To which Shylock responds, I cannot tell. I make it breed as fast. In The Merchant of Venice, Shylock appeals to a peculiar biblical example of pastoral power. To defend his profession of money lending, he tells his new client, Antonio, the story of Jacob's flock from the book of Genesis. Jacob wants to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel, so he agrees to take care of his sheep. However, Jacob makes a deal with Laban that he can keep the small number of striped sheep in the flock for himself as wages for his labor. In order to extract the maximum profit from this deal, Jacob resorts to a devious act of animal husbandry. He places striped tree branches in front of Laban's sheep whilst they are mating, which leads them to give birth to striped lambs, and so he can claim the additional sheep in the flock as his own. 
Now, to be sure, Shylock's boast that he can make money breed as fast as sheep is the tokos, literally the offspring, the interest of a long philosophical and theological debate around usury. Firstly, his claim that Jacob was the original usurer because he generated a kind of interest upon Laban's debt breaks the scriptural prohibition upon money lending between Jews in Deuteronomy and other texts. Quote, thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. If Shylock transgresses the biblical sanction against usury, he also contravenes Aristotle's philosophical prohibition in the politics. In a rebuke to Aristotle's claim that money, unlike living beings, is essentially infertile, Shylock's analogy between usury and animal husbandry insists that money can indeed give birth to more money. If a certain anti-Semitic reading of Shakespeare's play has always positioned Shylock as the last remnant of a pre-modern pagan polity who must be converted by any means necessary into a good Christian civil subject, I take my point of departure in what follows from a long counter tradition that insists instead upon the untimely modernity of the Venetian moneylender. You could reference someone like Marx here and on the Jewish question. To be specific, I'm going to propose that Shylock's theory of usury is an early form of what Michel Foucault in his 1978-79 lectures at the Collège de France calls pastoral power. Quote, the act of conducting, directing, leading, guiding, taking in hand, and manipulating men, as Foucault puts it, at every single moment of their existence. For Foucault, of course, pastoral power is the precursor of modern governmentality, which also works via the constitution of a specific subject who is subjected to continuous networks of obedience and who is subjectified through the compulsory extraction of truth. In this new context, Shylock's boast to Antonio about breeding money is less a defense of usury than an assertion of the productive power of this Jewish pastor. What matters to the moneylender here is not what money really is. In fact, Shylock has no interest in the ontological status of money at all, but what it can do, what it can be used for, how it can be put to work, and who it may serve. In this paper, I'm going to offer a, a reading, actually a kind of bestiary, of the early modern and modern debate on usury that extends from Martin Luther up to Jeremy Bentham. So it's the pre-Marxian pre history of usury, if you like. I seek to build not only on a classic corpus that traces the birth of the rational, calculative, and in short, interested subject of modernity, but at the same time, I also seek to capitalize upon what I see as a, a lack, a deficit in this body of work upon the self-interested subject, a deficit that I want to call a lack of interest in interest. Because what really interests me here, interests me here, is that these two forms of interest, on the one hand, the philosophical anthropology called self-interest, and on the other hand, the finan financial product called interest, uh, appear, in, at least in the scholarly literature, to have nothing to do with each other. No one has ever asked the question what the two kinds of interest may have to do with each other, even though their histories, as we'll see, intersect at various key moments. And this is the question I want to, if not exactly answer, at least try and pose for you this evening. To fill the gap or to bridge the gap between the politi political economy of interest and the philosophical anthropology of interest, I want to propose that the debate on usury produces a specific theory of the subject. And this subject is not simply self-interested, as Albert O. Hirschman would say. It's not human capital, as Gary Becker and Michel Foucault would say, nor is it indebted man, as uh, Maurizio Lazzarato or Elettris Demili would say, but it's something I want to call human interest. So not human capital, but human interest. And this, very quickly, I want to define as a self 
whose intrinsic self-interest <coughs> excuse me, expresses itself paradigmatically through financial interest, and vice versa, whose borrowing and lending at interest reveals their innate propensity towards self-interest. So it's a kind of interested circle I'm going to describe for you. If Martin Luther's essay on usury and money from 1524 is generally taken to inaugurate the repeal, to begin the repeal of the medieval prohibition upon money lending, what is really at stake in this debate, I want to suggest, is actually a prohibition against the prohibition itself, or better put, a coercive normative production of the subject as a subject of interest. In Shakespeare, recall, Shylock actually grants Antonio an interest-free bond. But of course, the moneylender adds a stipulatio, a clause to the contract. Antonio himself, the pound of flesh, becomes the literally human interest to be repaid. Okay, so the, the first of four or five quite short uh, sections is called Offspring. In book one of the politics, Aristotle inaugurates the philosophical prohibition against interest. To very quickly summarize a famous argument, he distinguishes between two modes of wealth creation, economy, oikonomike, and money-making, crematistike. If economy names the management of the household, crematistics is instead driven by the unlimited desire to acquire personal wealth for its own sake. In usury, crematistics reaches its logical conclusion because here money can apparently be made from nothing other than money itself in an unlimited way, ad infinitum. To really get to the bottom of Aristotle's prohibition, we first need to recognize that lending money perverts what he sees as the intrinsic nature of money itself. Money has a nature for Aristotle. And it's money's nature to be nothing more than a medium of exchange for the exchange of objects. Accordingly, any exchange in which it, money becomes not merely the medium, but the object to be exchanged is perverse. For Aristotle, usury in particular perverts money because it makes money reproduce itself in the manner of a living being. This term, interest, tokos, which means the birth of money from money, he says, is of all modes of getting wealth, the most unnatural. In the philosopher's account, money then is infertile, and interest, tokos, offspring, is less its legitimate child than a kind of illegitimate, monstrous progeny. If Aristotle's politics establishes the original prohibition around which all futures of discuss discussions of usury will resolve, it also, like all prohibitions, prepares the ground for its own repeal. To begin with, the philosopher's choice of the word tokos, which originally referred to the offspring of sheep or cows to signify interest, recalls that there was once indeed a form of money that could breed by natural means. It's already very well known, by, documented by historians of money, that uh, money has its roots in, in cattle, uh, in, in livestock. Uh, all our terms uh, for, for money, pecus, pecuniary, capita, and so on, all originally uh, refer to livestock. But it's less well known that livestock is also the origin of interest. A herd of cows that was lent out for grazing uh, over winter would be returned in the spring with interest in the natural form of the offspring they produced. So Aristotle's use of the word tokos here, literally offspring, child, is a kind of interesting moment, an interesting choice, you know, when you're talking about something that is supposedly infertile. So how do we, how do we negotiate this? For Odd Langholm, Aristotle's real point in his critique of usury is not actually the naturalist claim that money cannot breed, but rather a more subtle ethical claim that it should not be made to breed. In arguing that interest is unethical, though, if that's really what he is doing, 
Aristotle, as we'll see, is going to create the space for early modern Christian uh, critics, like John Calvin, to dispense with philosophical naturalism altogether and to begin to construct a new ethical defense of usury. So uh, one of the themes of this paper is going to be the, the, the shift broadly or crudely speaking from a kind of philosophical naturalist reading of money to a, a kind of ethical reading of money. In contemporary or recent philosophy of debt as well, Aristotle's theory of economy has also been convicted of preparing the ground, ironically, for that unnatural form of wealth acquisition he calls crematistics. It's even possible to detect an originary crematistic perversion inside economy itself, which undermines the attempt to prohibit usury from within. To take Eric Allier's argument in Capital Times, for example, crematistics breaks through the closed circle of economy at the moment when, and I quote, the apparatus opens on to time. If Aristotle recognizes that there's always a temporal interval between selling and buying, because nobody who sells one object is instantaneously uh, uh, compelled to buy another, then during this interregnum, money ceases to be simply the medium of exchange between objects and begins to assume a value in itself as a kind of standing reserve of purchasing power. And here I quote from Allier, money mediated in relation to itself via the commodity emerges in the final analysis as its own unit, becomes an object itself. In this moment between every economic exchange, Money as a crematistic object in its own right is born. Okay, the next section is called Growth, and it's about Martin Luther. In his essay on usury and money from 1524, as I've suggested, Martin Luther really inaugurates the, pro the repeal of the ancient prohibition against usury. His specific target is not Aristotle per se, but the Christian Aristotelian prohibition against usury that's established by Thomas Aquinas, and in particular, Aquinas's very strange argument about the consumptibility of money. I'm not sure if anyone is, is familiar with this, but uh, Aquinas's claim is that money is effectively a fungible good, is equivalent to food and drink. To understand this claim, we need to put it in its original legal context. Money lending, uh, at this period to only took place via a legal con contract, a Roman contract called the mutum. And this contract regulated the sale of fungible goods like wine and wheat and so on. And as part of this contract, you could both charge for the good itself, you know, a certain amount of wheat, a certain amount of wine, and you could also charge a fee for the use thereof, the use of this thing. And this contract actually became the the, the basis, uh, the original legal uh, basis by which uh, uh, usury uh, could take place. However, Aquinas uh, attacks this notion of the consumptibility of money. If we consume wine, he says, when we use it for drink, and if we consume wheat when we use it to eat, so we also consume money in using it to buy things. And thus, he says, it's unfair to force someone to pay both for the thing itself, the principle, and its use, the interest. So Aquinas' conclusion is that usury is effectively selling the same thing twice. You know, it would be like selling you a bottle of wine for 10 euros and then charging you another 10, 10 euros when you decide to drink it. To understand why Luther is able to argue that money can grow without being consumed away, we first need to recognize that he changes the grounds of debate. It remains true that usury is contrary to natural law, but crucially, this law is no longer synonymous with Thomist natural law theory, but with a so-called golden rule of Christian mutual ethics. For Luther, usury is, quote, contrary to the natural law, which the Lord announces in Luke 6, 31 and Matthew 7, 12. In moving away from the old naturalist question of whether money can reproduce itself, Luther thus shifts the grounds of his critique to the normative question of whether it ought to reproduce itself. 
And if we want an example of this, we can turn to Luther's argument against a very common early modern financial product called rent purchasing or, or Zinskauf. To get round the, the, the canonical, the church's prohibition against lending money at interest in this period, what would typically happen is a creditor would instead sell goods, such as a field, in return for a fixed annual income, an annuity. Okay, so you weren't lending anything, uh, you were actually selling something in return for uh, an annuity. And in Luther's critique, Zinskauf, rent, rent purchasing is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because contrary to the golden rule, he says, it produces an asymmetrical exchange which transfers all risk uh, to the buyer and guarantees an entirely risk-free income to the seller. Money, he says, engaged in business and money put out at Zins are two different things. The latter has a base which is constantly growing and producing profit out of the earth without any fear of capital losses while there's nothing certain about the former, and the only interest it yields is accidental. In a similar way to Aristotle's naturalist prohibition against crematistics, though, Luther's ethical prohibition against money lending ironically only serves to make its ethical normalization possible and even inevitable. To establish his critique of usury, as we've seen, Luther presides over a kind of paradigm shift in the philosophy of money lending from an Aristotelian naturalism to a new species of ethical consequentialism, which renders the original critique of money lending relatively trivial. Money no longer has an intrinsic nature that can be perverted by the usurer because its value consists purely in the uses to which it can be put. So if rent purchasing is wrong, it's not because it renders money sterile or anything like that, but rather because it makes money excessively fertile. Money put out at Zins is constantly growing and producing profit out of the earth. For Luther, the real problem with rent purchasing is its very productivity, and this is the reason why it must be ethically prohibited. Zinskauf generates, as I suggested, a guaranteed for the return for the investor, which carries none of the risks associated with other forms of financial speculation. In rejecting the naturalist critique of usury, though, and arguing that it's only an unethical use of money, I think Luther also leaves the door open for future defenders of usury to claim that interest can, in fact, fulfill the rules of natural equity and through this door is going to come John Calvin. In Calvin's De Usuris Responsium from 1545, just a, a few years later, Luther's ethical prohibition against usury is itself overturned. To pursue the line of inquiry opened up by Luther, to go through the door that, that Luther opens, Calvin argues in a kind of proto-Spinozian uh, uh, reading of, of the Bible, that there is no scriptural prohibition against usury, that all those texts like Deuteronomy and so on uh, do not actually contain any fixed message from God saying usury is wrong. So if usury is wrong, it can only be uh, because it is in some sense unethical. The real value of usury can only be determined ethically. And he says, one must judge usury not according to a statement of God, but according to the rule of equity. So much, uh, so far, so, so Lutheran. However, Calvin also exploits the loophole that Luther's ethical prohibition leaves open, a loophole which will make the normalizing of usury possible. If uh, Luther saw rent purchasing, as I've suggested, as a kind of zero-sum game, where one party wins and the other party uh, loses, Calvin will argue that in cer certain circumstances, usury can be mutually beneficial to both parties. And he goes and lists a whole list of conditions. If both parties freely enter into the agreement, if the rate of interest is not so high, if both parties can obtain uh, advantage, then yes, Luthery, uh, usury, money lending can fulfill the golden rule. To turn Luther's ethical critique of money lending into a defense, Calvin pursues the former's consequentialism to its conclusion. He completely dismisses Aristotle's naturalist critique 
of usury as an absurd literalism. Quote, I admit that children see that if you shut money away in a box, it will be sterile, but we grown-ups know that things are more complicated than that. Again, money no longer has a nature in itself. It is what it does or what it can be used for in the world. If money is instead a matter of what Calvin calls common utility, this is the term that he introduces, then the real question becomes whether such uses may be of mutual benefit to uh, both parties in the exchange. And as I've suggested, his answer to that question is yes. If utility, this thing called common utility, is the only basis upon which usury may be judged, then Calvin also doesn't need to dis differentiate between what predecessors like Luther regarded as both legally and ethically very different financial transactions, uh, such as leasing a house for income, buying a field for investment, lending money at interest. The first two were fine up to this point, the latter, the last one, not so much. But if all of these different financial mechanisms or products are to be judged purely in terms of their utility, then uh, we're in a completely different ballgame. So to refute the charge that money lending is unethical, Calvin directly compares it for the first time to these other permissible forms of economic exchange. It would be permissible, he says, to rent out a field. Oh, sorry. It would be permissible to rent out a field and impose a charge, and yet it would be illegal to take some fruit from money. What? When does anyone ever buy a field thinking that money does not beget money? So he's comparing usury to, to a very different kind of uh, financial uh, practice here, buying a field and, and uh, 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 renting, it, renting it out for income. But as I said, if both these things are to be judged in the same terms, then uh, that, that comparison becomes possible. In John Sauer's verdict, Calvin's ethical consequentialism collapses the distinction between lending money at interest and these other forms of transaction, leasing land for profit, into a common productivity of outcome. The theoretical horizon is the horizon of money in use for producing an income. In many ways, then, Calvin's theory of common utility comes to replace Lutheran mutual equity as the basic philosophical currency of the usury debate. To reiterate his main thesis, Calvin argues that in the absence of any clear scriptural injunction, all economic exchanges must be evaluated ethically, and usury is permissible if it is in accordance with the golden rule. Yet, it's precisely this decision to define money solely in terms of its economic utility or productivity which enables him to make an ethical judgment upon the values of such uses in the first place. For Calvin, what makes usury equivalent to every other legal form of economic exchange is not the ethical, but the economic equity of the exchange. They all produce an income, whether it's profit, yield, or interest. If every exchange is already judged to be equivalent to every other in minimal economic terms, then it becomes almost inevitable that the theologian can go on to judge them to be ethical, equivalent in ethical terms as well. In predetermining interest itself as potentially ethical, Calvin also paves the, paves the way for successors to argue that it produces an equally ethical set of subjects of interest. And in my final two examples, I'm now going to move on to the, the figure of the subject. In Benjamin Franklin's letter of advice to a young tradesman written by an old, man, old one, written 200 years after uh, Calvin, a text which is the subject of a very famous reading by, by Max Weber, of course, we begin to glimpse the emergence of this theory of the subject as what I've called human interest. To defend usury, Franklin draws yet another Shylockian analogy between breeding animals and breeding money. Remember, he says, that money is of a prolific generating nature. Money can beget money, and its offspring can beget more, and so on. Five shillings turned is six, turned again to seven and threepence, and so on till it becomes a hundred pound. The more there is of it, the more it produces every turning, so that the profits rise quicker and quicker. 
He that kills a breeding sow destroys all her offspring to the thousandth generation. He that murders a crown destroys all it might have produced, even scores of pounds. In making money breed like cattle, Franklin not only refutes Aristotle's original prohibition against usury here, but I want to argue also begins to institute the nascent theory of pastoral power, which for me is at the core of the usury controversy. Money does not only produce money, tokos, offspring, interest, but a species of subject who is normatively compelled to produce money from money. To transform the early modern defense of interest into this modern theory of the subject as a subject of interest, Franklin, again, like Calvin, posits a basic equivalence between every form of economic exchange on the grounds of their common utility and productivity. If Calvin saw no difference between the economic return on loans and leases, Franklin likewise subsumes all forms of return upon money, profit, income, interest, under the signifier turnings. What defines the nature of money is only its capacity to turn and return in the virtuous circle of economic exchange. In a dramatic inversion of Aristotle's claim that usury is contrary to nature, what's unnatural here, indeed an act of economic murder, is refusing to make money out of money. Quote, he that murders a crown destroys all that it might have produced. If there's one big difference between Franklin and his predecessors, though, is that his focus here is not upon interest per se, but upon the subject of interest, the young tradesman or woman. Franklin is putting himself not so much in the position of a financial advisor to his young friend, but a pastoral one. What is preached here, as Weber observes, is not simply a means of making one's way in the world, but a peculiar ethic. For Weber, what Franklin presents is a kind of deontology of capitalist accumulation in which, quote, it becomes the ideal of the honest man of recognized credit and above all, the idea of, the of a duty of the individual towards the increase of his capital. In Calvin's consequentialist defensive usury, as we've seen, it's ethically permissible to borrow and lend at interest when the outcome is mutually beneficial. But Franklin begins to transform this negative freedom into a stronger positive one. A good subject is not merely permitted, but normatively compelled to increase their capital. In the same way as Calvin's ethical defense of interest, however, Franklin's own ethical apology for the subject of interest inevitably raises the suspicion that is, it is itself wholly interested, wholly self-interested. The literal golden rule of economic equity trumps the biblical golden rule of ethical equity. To justify capitalist accumulation, Franklin appeals to the virtue of honest labor. But as Weber himself observes, labor is only virtuous insofar as it makes possible accumulation. Quote, honesty is useful, because it assures credit. If Calvin's unprecedented decision to treat money lending as economically equivalent to leasing, investing, and so on, predetermines his decision to see the borrower and lender as ethically equivalent parties in an honest exchange, then Franklin's own ethical theory of the subject, honest, hardworking, prudent, etc., is the internalization of this economic theory. Any virtue that does not serve to maximize income, a good deed, say, done purely for its own sake, is an act of profligacy or waste. In Franklin's Young Tradesman, Calvin's crypto-economic ethic of usury thus becomes a crypto-economic interested ethic of the subject, a subject who is now normatively compelled to make money out of money. Okay, final section is on Jeremy Bentham. In Jeremy Bentham's Defense of Usury from 1787, the economic subject I'm trying to call human interest is finally, I think, born. To defend usury 
Bentham finally proposes the libertarian argument that everyone has the liberty of making their own terms in money bargains. It's no longer possible to speak of usury as ethically unjust here, even when it involves apparently excessive rates of interest. By this point in history, usury has completely lost its old definition, which is any form of, of lending money at interest, and has become associated with excessive rates of, in, of, of interest, which is the meaning it has today. But Bentham even wants to attack this. According to Bentham, there's no such thing as too much interest if both creditor and debtor agree upon the terms. If even Calvin, criticizes high rates of interest on loans as contrary to natural equity, Bentham attacks the very idea of rate ceilings as a remnant of the old Christian, Christian Aristotelian theory of the just price, that every, every object has a, has a real price, it's a natural price, it's not determined by uh, the market. For Bentham, what lies at the bottom of this defensive usury is a new ethical desideratum that explodes not merely the Thomist strong naturalist critique, but the weak Calvinist ethical defense. Any individual, as I've said, should be free to lend or borrow money on whatever terms they uh, uh, choose, regardless of natural or of positive law. To pursue this argument, Bentham's essay begins by rehearsing the basic move I've been tracking throughout this essay, from a naturalist to an ethical consequentialist theory of money. He once again parodies Aristotle's claim that money does not beget money as an absurd uh, naturalization. As he explains in yet another Shylockian lesson, money has no intrinsic nature, but can be bred economically by being put to work. A consideration, he says, that didn't happen to present itself to that great philosopher is that although a Darek, a gold coin, would not beget another Darek any more than it would a ram or a ewe, yet for a Darek which a man borrowed, he might get a ram and a couple of ewes, and that the ewes where the ram left with him a certain time would probably not be barren, and so on. If Bentham is once again able to posit a direct equivalence between usury, leasing, and investment, even, as I've said, to the point of defending, borrowing, and lending at very high rates of interest, it's because, as we've begun to see in Franklin, all these exchanges have a common origin in the same theory of a subject. In Bentham's reckoning, human interest is not merely a norm to be observed by aspiring tradespersons, but nothing less than a philosophical anthropology. Human beings are now intrinsically interested subjects, rational, calculative, economic, and borrowing and lending at interest is the free expression of this capacity. If Bentham's essay is rather obscure today, G.K. Chesterton, no less, claims that it marks, and I quote, the beginning of the modern world. What is at stake is not simply a modern theory of political economy as unfettered from state regulation, but I've tried to suggest a modern theory of the subject as a subject of interest. To produce a self-interested subject, we all allegedly are. Bentham affirms the natural and rational freedom of the individual to act according to their own interests in economic exchanges, independently of any third party. Yet again, what Bentham calls freedom here is not the negative liberty to borrow or not borrow as we so wish, because this liberty is now so irresistible a natural law that human beings cannot help but act upon it, even if prohibited by positive law. For Bentham, whose essay was written as a riposte to Adam Smith's defense of state regulation of interest rates in the wealth of nations, the then British government's attempt to impose an artificial ceiling on rates represents a grotesque parody of Smith's theory of the invisible hand. In its artificial intents to restrain the irresistible natural right to borrow and lend, the state prohibition on usury succeeds only in becoming a machine for making criminals. Quote, the law neither has found nor may it ever hope to find any other expedient than that of hiring a man to break his engagement and to crush the hand that has been reached out to help him. 
In Bentham's defense of usury then, the attempt to repeal the prohibition of usury finally turns full circle. What began with the denaturalization of Aristotle's theory of interest by its conversion into a consequentialist ethics ends up with the renaturalizing of the human being herself as precisely a subject of interest. To repeat, what's at stake here is not simply repealing the prohibition on money lending, but pro prohibiting the prohibition itself by installing within the subject a pastoral injunction to borrow or lend as the natural and rational expression of human freedom. It's allegedly, allegedly predicated upon ethical utility, which is to say on the mutual benefit of both parties. But again, its implicit foundation is something closer to pure economic utility, namely the irresistible crematistic productivity of money itself. As a consequence, Bentham's philosophical anthropology and his, his anthropological apology for the natural freedom of the individual to borrow on whatever terms they see fit contains a coercive dimension. The subject is compelled normatively to realize this supposed freedom to increase their capital, even in cases such as high-risk speculation or loan sharking that may well threaten their self-interest. For Bentham, the ideal subject is no longer the humble tradesman or woman, it's the venture capitalist. And if we wish to glimpse the legacy that Bentham's essay bequeaths to political modernity, to us, we need only jump forward another couple of hundred years to 1970 and to The Economist Milton Friedman's Newsweek article entitled Defense of Usury. In calling for the abolition of federal and state ceilings on interest rates for mortgages, loans, credit cards, etc., as an essential plank of his monetarist revolution, Friedman transforms Bentham's call for the repeal of the prohibition of usury into a call for what will ultimately become neoliberalism and human interest into an avatar for the neoliberal subject. Okay, just a, a brief conclusion. In this paper, I've argued that the story of the repeal of the prohibition upon money lending at interest is thus finally the story of the pastoral production and extraction of the subject as a species of human interest, a subject who circularly, tautologically expresses her natural and rational self-interest by borrowing and lending at interest. To create human interest, Calvin and his successors retroactively posit the subject themselves as the cause of money's own incredible crematistic productivity. The self-interested subject becomes the retroactively naturalized foundation of financial interest. Yet what they present as the natural philosophical anthropological cause of political economy is, I've suggested, nothing more than political economy itself folded back into a coercive anthropology. Because if any subject finds themselves in a position where there's, there's a contradiction between the demands of anthropology and political economy, between who they must be and what they must do, between self-interest and financial interest, then the virtuous circle of human interest quickly turns vicious. The self-interested subject, Bentham's very clear on this, is normatively compelled to carrying on, carry on seeking to maximize her capital by making economic exchanges, including transactions, credit card transactions, payday loans, other high interest debt, which pose an existential risk to their interest. So we sacrifice our interest to our interest, bizarrely. In this respect, Shakespeare's Antonio, the Venetian venture capitalist who nearly pays his debt to Shylock with his life, is indeed the fatal prototype of human interest. Now to be sure, political theorists have labored for a long time to trace the origins of the modern self-interested entrepreneurial subject that we all supposedly are. But as I've said, we can detect a curious lack of interest in interest within this body of work, which extends all the way back to Hirschman's The Passions and the Interests from 1977. If Hirschman acknowledges that the anthropological concept of interest has a historical precursor 
in the economic concept of interest. Interest uh, is the, the original French concept he mentions. He almost immediately mentions this and just moves, moves back to the more abstract concept of rational or calculative self-interest. This is a problem I've been talking about, is what do these two interests have in common with each other? In the concept of human interest, we can perhaps begin to stitch these two histories of interest whose interests coincide from the early modern period onwards into one single history. And Michel Foucault is uh, also guilty of this lack of interest in interest. If he speaks of pastoral power as an economy of souls, uh, he has very little interest in that other salvific economy called financial interest. A good shepherd, he says, is precisely not one who seeks to profit from his flock, but who devotes himself wholly to their welfare. Yet even so, I still think we can glimpse a potential theory of human interest in Foucault's history of the Christian pastorate more generally. His 1971 lectures on penal theories and institutions describe the prohibition upon usury as not simply a kind of truth-telling, but a form of political power. And the lectures of the government of the living, the later lectures, uh, talk about Tertullian's account of the sacrament of baptism as setting in motion uh, an economic theological dispositif in which the confessor must, quote, pay the price upon the original, quote, debt of sin via the, quote, coin of repentance, only to find that the price of forgiveness turns out to be infinite. In telling the story of those bad shepherds like Calvin, Franklin, and Bentham, who breed money, virtue, and the human subject herself in an economy of salvation, which is actually a purgatory of infinite and unredeemable debt, we can perhaps begin to fill this lacuna within Foucault's pastoral power. So what, to conclude, might be the contemporary fate of Shylock's boast that he can make money breed as fast as sheep. It's worth recalling here Bonnie Honig's claim that every bank in the world now extends Shylock's promise or threat to its savers and borrowers. We will make your money grow. We will make your money work for you, and so on. At the same time though, and as I was writing uh, the first draft of this essay several years ago, it might be possible to construct a more precise constellation between Shakespeare's Venice of 1600 and the contemporary Italy of 2019-2020. To witness the standoff in early 2019 between the Italian government and the European Union over the former's public spending program, a program which exceeded the fiscal limits prescribed by the EU Stability and Growth Pact, we can perhaps begin to glimpse not simply the latest sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone, but the pastoral production of even sovereign states as so much human interest. If Shylock insisted on extracting a pound of Antonio's flesh, even if it meant the debtor would die and the debt would go unpaid, we can find the same fatal economic logic at work in the relation between the EU and its most indebted member states. Italy had to repay its sovereign debt by instituting so-called tears and blood reforms. But we already know from Greece that spending cuts mean that sovereign debt cannot be repaid. And so the EU will compel states to take on even more debt in the form of IMF loans to repay their original debts, by which time, if such time ever arrives, they will supposedly be deemed credit worthy again in the eyes of the markets, which means that they can borrow money and the whole process begins from scratch. In our contemporary Venices, it seems that Shylock continues to breed gold and silver like ewes and rams. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Arthur, uh, which was great. Uh, so now it's time for comments, questions. Who will break the ice and go first? Yes, first of all, thank you for this uh, Friday night lecture. It was really uh, much more vivid than the uh, night outside, I think. Okay. And uh, <laughs> my question will be very simple. What's the function of uh, the sexual difference 
in the usage of the, all these metaphors of money breeding, because the animals are all females, but left alone, they will be barren. Yeah. Uh, so, on the other hand, the money doesn't need a sexual difference to reproduce. It's uh, more, it can reproduce more on level of mitosis or a virus, if you will. Yeah. So, uh, wasn't at uh, the end Aristotle right? Wasn't in the end Aristotle right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. what is the function of sexual difference? I think we, what we need is a Lacanian. Is, is there any Lacanians here tonight <laughs> that can answer this question much, much, much better than me? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, as I said, it, it, we don't really know what Aristotle means by in his, his critique of usury. I mean, and the point I was making, I guess, is the fact, you know, the fact that he uses the word tokos, offspring, to describe usury, is that there actually, there was a, you know, the first form of money was natural and did naturally reproduce, okay? So the claim that money and Crematistics, if you go back into the history of ancient Greece, it's, it comes about, what, you know, why does this, this prohibition come about? It's partly to do with the move from a cash economy, from a barter economy to a cash economy. So this is a, a, a kind of prohibition that is being established. It's, it's kind of shutting a door after it's already bolted, okay? Uh, after the horse is already bolted, to use, to, to use the English expression, which is that, you know, as I said, there was originally a natural form of money. Money originally could reproduce and could reproduce by itself. So the prohibition is, I don't know, some, perhaps somewhat artificial, you know, and that, that leads some people to say, such as Odd Langholm, that it's not really a naturalist prohibition at all. I mean, wh what's interesting, I think, is that when you get to people like Bentham and Calvin, is you know it's very much in their interests to paint Aristotle as this kind of absurd literalist. You know, I mean, I say this in a slightly you know I don't want to be misunderstood in saying this, but it's almost a kind of you know going back to Shylock, it's a reading of Aristotle as a kind of Jew. You know, is that he's a contractualist, he's a literalist. And so all the examples, all the thought experiments they use to parody or criticize Aristotle is this idea that, oh, he thinks that if you, you know, if you put money in the ground, will it grow or something? Well, of course it doesn't. Nobody thinks that, you know? So um, that's about the best I can do for the moment, if that's, if that's okay. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Next. Arthur, thank you. Hi. And hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just, um, no, uh, it was a very interesting uh, lecture for me. And I think it's very interesting what you, like interesting, the interest and mm. the, um, the link you want to make between the interest as an economic and as, mm. I don't know, social term. Um, but uh, can you, I don't know, just because, I, uh, unfortunately, I'll not be able to come to your next late lectures, but um, to just like show or reveal a little bit more on wh when you plan to where to go or where you plan to develop this idea of yeah. human interest. Yeah, sure. It's um, yeah. I mean, this is this is part of a a, a slightly different project to, to the one that I've been presenting this week. Um, which is, is kind of about the, the future of sacrifice and what happens to religious sacrifice in particular as, as, it's, as we move into the early modern period uh, uh, and beyond. Um, I, uh, during lockdown, one of uh, the great pleasures I had, it was a pleasure for me rather than for her, was I had to homeschool my daughter, uh, who was eight years old then. And one of the things I had to teach her was religious education. And we were doing the story of Abraham and Isaac Okay, you know that uh, Abraham has to take his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah and uh, sacrifice him to God. And we, were, we got to that bit in the story, which I always find really funny when Isaac kind of turns around to his father and says, okay, dad, where's the sacrifice? You know, great, you know, and, 
uh, you know, and without realizing that, that he is the sacrifice. And, and, you know, my daughter started to look at me a little bit strangely at that point, you know, so it's, just, so it's a slightly different moment in our relationship. But I thought, you know, I, I love that moment because it, it, it kind of tells you that if you have to ask what the sacrifice is or who the sacrifice is, then the answer is it's probably you. Okay, just like on the internet, you know, if you have to ask what's being sold here, the answer is you, all right? And what's really interesting about the usury debate is at one level, the vocabulary of it is entirely anti-sacrificial, right? I mean, this is, I don't say this anywhere in, in, in this paper, but the whole, you know, at a very crude level, what it's about is saying, don't kill your animals. It's a really dumb thing to do, okay? Breed them and get more of them. Okay, the, the language, uh, uh, and you know, this is, there's a political, economic, political, theological logic here, which is all at play in the Middle Ages, which is about prohibiting religious sacrifice, prohibiting martyrdom, disavowing all these, you know, crazy things that are, that are going on in, 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 in early modern Europe and the early modern state. But I think what I'm trying to get at is, is that line of, you know, the, of Isaac's, which is that if you have to ask where's the sacrifice, then, then it's probably you. Because I think there, I mean, what, what I've been trying to uh, articulate, hopefully, is that there is a sacrificial logic at work in self-interest, where paradoxically we have to sacrifice everything in order to maintain this thing called our self-interest, where high risk and, and, you know, caution or calculation apparently, apparently co coincide in one another. And um, so, yeah, so I, I, I sort of see that there's a, an interesting return of the repressed, whatever you want to call it, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in this discourse around, around usury, where there is something being sacrificed here, but it's not animals anymore, it's not the Holocaust, it's not the fatted calf or anything like that. It, it's, it's the Isaacs, it's the child, it's the, in this case, it's the debtor. So, so that's one of the directions in which, which I'm going. <coughs> Thank you, Arthur. Uh, this was very rich and very, you know, very uh, going in various directions. Uh, the whole debate on usury, I really have to digest it first. But uh, in a way, I do agree that uh, the whole story is somehow centered upon sexuality because it's, right, it's yeah. first it, there's a prohibition and then in the end you have injunction. Yeah. And, uh, of course, as Lacanian, I'm also yeah. thinking about superego dimension, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, in a way, I would say that uh, the, hmm, the, terminology, the terminology here is also misleading. Because from the beginning on, we have a debate about slavery. Yeah. Because uh, Aristotle is in a society where, where slavery is permissible. Know, yeah. Yeah. rules and uh, all the time when uh, I, I, I mean the same as Mirt I was also thinking in, uh, uh, through the metaphor of sexual act in a way mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know the, the two sides you can, you can understand but on yeah. the other hand the political context, context is also slavery so yeah. and breeding animals etc so does it, I mean, how do you think about this connection to slavery? And uh, second thing, mm. uh, first, it didn't seem to me somehow some link with the pastoral power didn't really click for me. Okay. Yeah. Until the end, because yeah. you mentioned the austerity politics. And somehow in neoliberalism, you, you also have this dimension which is not strictly economic. Uh, in, yeah. I mean, it's not economic at all, but it's somehow connected to this sacrificial logic that you mentioned in a way, yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, the mention of the soul and, and, yeah. and everything. I mean, the, the Margaret Thatcher also mentioned somewhere souls yeah, yeah, that yeah, are yeah. not yeah. Uh, totally uh, blabbing. Uh, because the whole this debate that you mentioned at the end, you know, uh, in terms of European Union, etc., yeah. somehow does bring uh, the dimension which probably 
is not connected to the whole deba debate of the usury, but it somehow comes uh, around into the picture. So th that would be my, but I think it, it would be worth, uh, it would be worth, worth uh, putting all this story in the context of sexuality and slavery as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, somehow. So uh, the question about slavery and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, what I mean, was the, what was the other thing about neoliberalism as as uh, some uh, the other the other dimension, which is strictly theological in a way. Somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll take the neoliberalism one first. I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about um, the Merchant of Venice is that it's it's not really dis despite appearances it's not really a play about the self-interested subject you know because actually Shylock has absolutely zero interest in getting a return on his uh, investment if you like in Antonio he wants to kill him okay like he hates Antonio because Antonio has you know is destroying him and destroying his livelihood and uh, and all this this, the, this kind of thing so in a strange, it's a play, strangely, it's a play about the pre-interest, the pre-interested subject, if you, if, if you like, and vice versa. I think you know the end of the play, which I read as a kind of Christian triumphalism, is is an act of of hate as well. It's a kind of revenge upon upon Shylock's own revenge. What's this got to do with the European Union? Well, uh, tears and tears and blood reform, as they as they call it in 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 Italy. This was the the austerity measures. I mean, as we all know, uh, debt and guilt are intertwined, okay, all right, uh, uh, historically. So there's both a moral, a moral dimension and a, a financial uh, dimension to debt. What I think is going on is, and this, I mean, Nietzsche would, would say something about this, I think, is that, you know, the moral and the financial economies of debt have, have completely separated. Because everyone knows that Greece, for example, will never, ever be able to repay this debt, okay? It's completely impossible. But at the same time, there will never be a debt jubilee or a debt, a debt amnesty upon, upon Greece. So what you've got is a kind of moral economy uh, of debt, which is you will pay, which is completely uneconomic now. Like, I don't think any, you know, no one, I, you know, I'm not, I have no privileged inside knowledge, but nothing I've read suggests that, that this money is in any way reparable. So it's a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a relation of sort of, of, of hatred or punishment, in a way, or, 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 or cruelty to, the, to these states. You know, it really is tears and blood. That, that, that's the way I see it. I mean, once you have a moral economy that's completely separated from the, from the financial economy, what, what is left? Um, the only interesting thing I have to say about slavery and sexuality is Artemidorus's interpretation of dreams. There's a wonderful section where he says that if you dream, uh, let me see if I can remember this correctly, where he says if you dream that um, uh, you're masturbating with your hand, that means that you're going to have sex with your slave. It might be the other way around. It's one of the two. But, and the reason for this is very, and the reason for this is like, it's not, this is not, there's nothing Freudian about this at all. It's, it's actually, it's because, you know, the, fra the slave is effectively, you know, your hand is a tool of tools. You know, that's what Aristotle famously says, okay? And the slave is the living tool, okay? So the slave is just a kind of distributed part of your own body. It's just a hand that happens to be walking around, you know, like a visible hand in this case, as opposed to, to the invisible hand. So, yeah, make of that what you will. Just another comment to, yeah, yeah. to European Union again. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what really uh, stands out then is if this doesn't, you, if the debt is uh, beyond, you, you know, economic reasons, etc., it serves also in uh, some sort of, uh, it serves uh, to stabilize or to fix power relations. So, yeah. the North will be North, Meaning, and the South, Greece, etc., will be slaves of the North. In a way. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, it has its own reasons then, but uh, I think slavery somehow has to be counted in this debate. But I, I don't have a clue how. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. 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 
I mean, the, la the last point as well as on this one is, you know, why do, why do prohibitions and injunctions come into existence? You know, why does Aristotle say at that point in history that, you know, slavery is natural? There is such a thing as natural slaves, okay? Slavery is not coercive or violent. Well, it's because people are saying, actually, this is wrong. You know, he's very clear about this. He actually says it. I mean, I, I think, you know, Agamben does a reading of this in Use of Bodies, which, I, you know, I don't... I, you know, I literally think is, is incorrect. He said that there was this idea that slavery was, uh, that, that the, the theory of natural slavery, you know, is an idea, ideological naturalization of power relations. Like uh, Gambon says that this is a totally modern anachronistic reading of, of our, like no one was saying this at the time. It's there in the politics. He says quite explicitly, people are saying this is unjust, but it's not because, because it's natural. So, you yeah. know. <laughs> it's, always, it's always an interesting question is to ask why prohibitions and injunctions appear when they do. And it's always because this is becoming an issue, isn't it? You know, why does it have to be put down in this form? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, just a quick uh, thought that I had uh, listening to this debate about austerity and so on. So in Aristotle, the story begins with basically Aristotle saying that, I mean, the focus of the prohibition from Aristotle on was more on the lending part yeah. and now the prohibition is more on the borrowing part so yeah. it's immoral to borrow but not to lend and maybe that's the one of the paradoxes of the austerity politics. Huh? Yeah, yeah, thanks, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much Arthur, this was really great um, and I would like to introduce actually perhaps, um, I don't know if it the other side or some uh, added thing to this discussion which is more or less focused on the precisely on this signifier of austerity and of the imperative even with the imperative to produce we are actually uh, losing and getting more and more in depth and so on yeah. uh, introduce perhaps another dimension which I think is also very present today which is the excessive um, um, how is it called uh, Expenditure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm here really, I will try to recall the argument. I was asked, asked to review a book, uh, a great book that will come out soon, I think, with Stanford University Press uh, on, the, on, the, of, on money and on how, how ma something in money changed, let's say, mm. uh, at some point, relative, not simply with capitalism, perhaps even at some point within capitalism. Uh, but the guy makes like a couple of extremely interesting points. One is that actually very often now the point is that we uh, use money, we pay for paying. We yeah. pay to be able to pay. There is this kind of excessive, it's not simply we pay for prestige, but it's really there is an object that money cannot buy, mm. but you buy it precisely by paying excessively yeah. with your money. So yeah. there yeah. is a certain... Uh, something which is not simply this negative, uh, let's say, um, yeah. or, or this imperative to more and more, uh, and people would go and literally like throw money. Uh, uh, I mean, so there is also this uh, idea that the richness today to be rich is not simply you can you pay to be rich. Or uh, at this, uh, when I read this book, it kind of reminded me of something that Lacan says in I think it's seminar. Uh, 17, uh, a phrase that I never really understood, but now I think I got it when he says, commenting on the, on the book, The Wealth of Nations, mm. he says something, uh, okay, but it's so funny that nobody never uh, remarked or said it like this, but what is wealth? Wealth is the property, the, uh, the, the quality of the wealthy. It's not like the amount of money. It yeah. is the quality, there is a certain quality that uh, money cannot buy, but in some way, so I was just wondering how you would uh, feed this excessive, let's say, expenditure and this kind of object that is yeah. also on the market, but not in functioning in a slightly different way to this uh, story that you are. That's so interesting, yeah. Um, oh gosh, I'd have to think about that. Um, I mean, the figure of Bassanio, to answer it in a slightly different way, the figure of Bassanio is in, in The Merchant of Venice is an incredibly interesting character because, I mean, he's, he's the guy who's effectively taking out the loan. Antonio is the middleman who takes out the loan on his behalf uh, for Shylock. Uh, 
Why does he take out the loan? Because he wants to get married, okay? And he's got this beautiful girl in his sights who's kind of totally out of his league. And it, it gradually emerges you know, from pretty early on in the play that this guy is living in this, this kind of fantasy world of credit, that he, just, he has no money whatsoever. He has a lifestyle that he really cannot, cannot sustain or afford. But which, so, you know, wealthy without wealth, if you know what I mean. Um, so I would probably want to, to, to kind of revisit that in the light of, of, of what you were saying. To go back to, what, to where you began also with the question of the signifier, and this is something that I didn't speak about in this text, is that there is a kind of usury of the signifier and a usury, a usury of language which takes place in all these texts, all right? Um, in The Merchant of Venice, you know, the, the very first quotation that, that I give, Antonio, when, when Shylock gives this very ingenious defense of usury, you know, through the story of Jacob's flock, Antonio you know, says, was this inserted to make interest good or is your gold and silver used in rams? And what he effectively is, is accusing him of being is, is a kind of usurer of the Bible, a usurer of, of, of language and squeezing kind of excess signification, surplus meaning from, from this original, original text. And what's really interesting about this whole scene between the two of them is there's this constant play between uh, punning between different words, between the word use, as in female sheep, between the word use, as in usury, and also between the word Jews. Uh, so it's constantly moving back and forth. By the time you get to someone like John Calvin, like when Calvin writes his letter on usury, it's actually a private letter that he's writing to a friend, okay? And the very first thing that he says in this letter is, I really want to make sure you understand. Like, don't, don't, don't let anybody see this. Don't let this fall out of your hands. It's so important that you understand that, I mean, this is for you and only for you. And it has no meaning outside of our, our, our specific exchange. This is because it's, it's dangerous politically and religiously to be, to be making some of the claims he's making. But there's also just this sense that usury begins to exceed the economic sphere. And, you know, once money becomes a question of the signifier, then it begins, it comes, the question of language becomes contaminated by this, this, this debate as well. So that, that's a very roundabout uh, uh, way of addressing uh, your point. <laughs> Last call. Okay, if there is no one else who would uh, like to um, give a comment or ask a question, I would uh, thank Arthur again and thanks everybody for, for, for coming. <laughs>